Thank you, Alison. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, we are going to look at how to um, how to package, release, and deploy uh, our uh, our applications on, on Android, and the um, specifically the the recent work in that area. Um, when talking about Android, I I mean both the um, uh, completely free software, Google free uh, variants like Lineage OS, uh, as well as the uh, proprietary variants, uh, like most prominently um, the Google Android. Uh, from our application point of view, those two are essentially the same. We don't use any of the proprietary uh, extensions anyway. Um, and what motivated that, uh, that recent work um, is somehow the problem that we have a number of our applications that actually work on Android and uh, would provide value there, um, but they are simply not available. Um, and in parts that, or in, that is largely our problem because we, we don't have the situation like uh, on Linux where uh, we have distributors taking care of this. Um, in this case, we are the distributor ourselves, uh, which means we have to do all the work. Um, and that work is a bit more than just uh, adding a, a tag in Git, right? Um, first of all, we need to build actual release packages. Um, they need to be optimized for size because the target platform is mobile and size and transfer volume is, is constrained there. Uh, we need to build from release tables to have the translations included. Um, we end up bundling a whole lot of third party uh, dependencies, which means we have to look after their licenses as well as uh, the licensing of our own software. Um, we need to have our packages in the corresponding app stores uh, as uh, site loading on Android is disabled by default and heavily discouraged. So practically, you have to be in the app store to, to be available. Um, in order to be in the App Store, we need the application metadata, um, logos, screenshots, translated description text, and all of that. And um, if you're looking at all that list, um, and remember that we have uh, nine KDE gear releases a year, at least, and 12 Plasma Mobile gear releases a year, um, times number of applications in parts, times of number of translations, right, that quickly gets out of hand. Um, so we need to automate as much as possible of that uh, in order for it to be sustainable. Um, the current situation, where current refers to early April when I wrote the talk proposal, um, there is very few of our applications actually available on Android. Um, for example, KD Connect, uh, Krita, and, uh, and Gcompre. They all use their own custom solution uh, for, for building, packaging, and, and distributing um, in parts because they have very special requirements. Uh, but in other parts, simply due to, due to the lack of uh, a better solution. Next to that, we have the uh, nightly build system on, on Binary Factory. So there we have about 25 apps um, that get daily builds based on the, on the latest developments uh, and have those put into a dedicated F-Troid repository. Um, that system is heavily optimized for uh, low maintenance and a low barrier of entry. Um, and that comes at a cost. Um, there is very little uh, there in in terms of custom or ability to customize the the packages. Dependencies are auto determined from the dependency metadata. Um, there is no way to customize build flags or select which version or version of a dependency gets included. Uh, so that's not ideal for polished release packages. Um, it is based on the uh, Android Docker SDK that we also recommend for local development. And it's using in parts the same tools. Um, so that makes it very easy uh, to use. And 
um, the results you see locally are very, very similar to the results you see in that system, which also helps to, to work with it. Um, and then if you look beyond Android, um, the standard solution we have for, uh, for the other platforms there is craft. Um, and then, of course, there is immediately the question, can we use that for, for Android as well? Um, that will allow us to reuse all the existing uh, package definitions and, and build instructions for pretty much all our applications. They are already present for, for Windows, Mac OS, and, and Linux app image. Um, and not just reuse that and like sharing the entire build definitions going forward, which uh, would be a big plus. Um, craft is also much more um, uh, tuned towards uh, building actual packages. So you have a lot more control over what goes, what exactly goes into the package. Uh, that starts with uh, building from release tables, so we get the translations. Uh, you can apply patches to that if necessary. Uh, you can pin dependency versions. Um, you have full control over all the build flags um, and so on. Um, on the other hand, there is the problem that uh, Craft has no notion of cross compilation. And that is something we need for Android. Uh, right? We are not building on an Android system. We are building on, say, a Linux system for an Android target. Um, and the other problem is that uh, craft is used to, to decide them, uh, itself what goes into the final package um, and, and drive that process, while on Android, that is done by the application build system. Um, about two months ago, we nevertheless managed to get that to work um, by cheating a bit. Um, we work around the cross compilation problem by assuming that everything that needs to be built for the host system, say mock for Qt or kconfig compiler for, for frameworks, are already present on the host system. And we can make that assumption because the uh, Android Docker SDK image uh, provides all the host tools already. Uh, so the only thing Craft still needs to do is build for Android. Um, and for that, we just pretend towards Craft it is building on Android and behind its back implement that as, as cross compilation. So it, it doesn't even realize it's doing cross compilation. Um, and that actually works quite well. Um, for any package that is uh, using um, a standard build system, that is largely transparent. Um, and especially for our own stuff, uh, the most you usually need to adjust is maybe um, tweak dependencies a little. Like on, on Android, you might not want to have a Dbus dependency. Uh, but that is, that is very straightforward. Um, there, is, uh, there is more fun to be had with uh, dependencies that use their own custom build systems. Um, but at least the crucial ones, so the dependencies of, of Qt and so on, um, they are already covered and, and working. Um, and we have that uh, deployed on binary factory uh, alongside the existing system for, uh, for the other platforms. Uh, and you can enable Android builds there for your application uh, using exactly the same mechanism. So there's the enable projects YAML file. Um, you just put your project in there and then select which and what architectures you want to, uh, to have covered. Uh, there's currently four of them supported, um, x86 and ARM, both in 32 and 64 bits. Um, and then uh, your package gets built, uh, and it's running through basically the same pipeline that we also have for the existing Nike build system, um, which means transferring the package to a secure system, getting it signed with the official KDE key, and then put into a, um, a separate F-Droid repository for that. So you can immediately test the result on your phone. Um, there's two build modes supported, um, release and Nightly. 
uh, release builds the latest release tarball, uh, and thus also gets you um, translations included. Uh, Nightly builds the latest uh, uh, development from, uh, from Git. Um, that gives us the option to replace the old Nightly build system uh, with that system as well. Um, that will have the advantage that we have unified everything on craft, and we only have a single system to maintain. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as I mentioned, the old system has the advantage of uh, having a very low barrier of entry. That isn't the case on the same, same level for craft. So there is a, a bit more complexity to, to learn in order to get started with this. Um, during the past days, we discussed ways to, to simplify this and to improve the documentation. So we might get to the point where we can actually replace the old system uh, uh, with the craft-based Nighty builds as well. Uh, but that is still uh, under discussion. Um, OK, so now we have uh, the package built, and uh, it hopefully contains uh, everything we, we need. Um, that isn't good to go yet, though. Um, the problem is that while there's everything in there we need, there is actually quite a lot more than that in it. Um, if you have ever looked at the uh, Nightly build packages we had uh, so far, they are all quite large. Um, so we need to turn them down. Um, and as with any optimization problem, the, uh, the first thing we need is a way to, to measure what we are changing. Um, there's two useful tools for that uh, in the Android SDK, um, the APK analyzer command line tool um, and the uh, corresponding UI for that in Android Studio. Um, if you just open one APK in there, you get a, uh, an overview on which parts contribute how much to the, uh, the needed space. Um, but more importantly, it's able to compare uh, two different APKs of the same application, and then you can uh, nicely see um, how things changed uh, if you applied some of the following uh, uh, mechanisms to it. Um, and then we get to uh, yeah, ways to actually optimize the content. Um, and they, the first thing to look into is do not install anything you don't need. And that goes both for your application as well as for all of your dependencies. Um, common example, uh, man pages might be nice to have on a, on a Linux system. They're utterly useless in an APK. Um, so look out for. Um, build options to exclude stuff like that. Um, if a dependency doesn't provide them, consider adding them. Um, if it's about stuff that will never be useful on, on Android, uh, and if not Android, conditional around the install commands might be good enough already. Um, and that anything that isn't installed will never make it into the package. So that, that is the easiest way. Um, the second thing to look at is do not link against stuff you don't need. Um, and that also is something that goes both for your application and for your dependencies. Um, and that is, um, uh, or the, the common offender for that is, um, is Qt widgets. That is a fairly large library, and it's something where a lot of other libraries have optional dependencies on it. So just by being present, uh, they end up linking against it. Um, we have, meanwhile, addressed that for Qt SVG, for Qt Quick Controls, and for K Notification. Um, that is common, lib uh, common dependencies of our, our applications. Uh, those will no longer drag in Qt widgets. Uh, but you might encounter that in, in other dependencies. Uh, and then it's usually a smaller uh, build system change to, uh, to resolve that. Uh, then the third part to look at um, is uh, plugins. 
the way plugins end up in, in a package is that the build system looks at the Android dependencies XML files uh, of all the libraries you link against. Uh, and those files can specify which plugins or which plugin types are supported by those libraries. And then all those plugins get uh, pulled in. Um, the, the common examples in there for things that, that you might not need are um, the QML tooling plugins, um, some of the more exotic image formats, and uh, the biggest ones usually are additional Qt Quick control styles, uh, especially the uh, asset heavy ones uh, based on images, um, Fusion, Imagine, and, and Universal. So um, uh, excluding those is, is often useful. Um, the way to do that is using the packaging options exclude list in, uh, in your build.gradle file. If you do not have a build.gradle file in your application, um, there's actually a default one shipped with Qt that is being used. So copy that next to your Android manifest and uh, adjust it. Um, and finally, there is a, a similar exclusion mechanism for, for asset files. Um, that is uh, basically anything that goes into user share on, on Linux. Uh, so all kinds of, of data files. Um, and anything you couldn't get rid of in, in step one, um, maybe because it's very application specific, uh, is something you can handle here. Um, say, uh, translation catalogs for a dependency where you're sure you're not using the translated messages, um, then you could, uh, could uh, remove that in, in this way. I mean, translation catalogs are usually very small, but they multiply by many, many different languages. Uh, so that can be worse. Um, slight problem with that is that the asset ignore pattern, unlike the plugin ignore pattern, um, uses a very bizarre and limited syntax and needs to be squeezed in a single line. Um, I have a link to a blog post on the last slide with some more details on, uh, uh, on that. Um, and all that um, actually uh, allows you to trim down the, the package quite a bit. Um, as an example, KDE itinerary started around with around 40 megabytes before all of that um, without translations. And we are now scratching on 20 megabytes, including translations. Um, there's still more, uh, more room for improvement there, uh, but that, that is quite reasonable already. OK, so now we have the, um, the size optimized package. Um, now we need to get it into the store. Uh, and for that, we first need the application metadata. So that is translated descriptions, screenshots, logos, etc. Um, the canonical source for that is the app stream file um, that I think most of our applications have and that are used for numerous other purposes already. Um, the Android toolchain in ECM uh, comes with a script that can convert the app stream file into the fast lane format, which is the format that the F-Droid store is consuming directly and that the Fastlane supply tool uh, uses, uh, which is the tool to talk to the Play Store um, automatically. Um, you have the ability to, to customize the output um, by putting uh, partial Fastlane data uh, into your repository. And then uh, the script will just fill in the gaps of uh, anything not specified there yet. So if you want to have different screenshots for Android, um, that is easily possible in this, this way, for example. Um, and this is how this then looks like. Uh, on, on the left, we have um, the uh, F-Droid app on the phone. Uh, on the right, we have the Google Play Store website. Um, the screenshots are taken in, within English language. But if, you, if you switch the system language, you also get other translations there. Um, on the f side, you see this uh, banner graphic. That is something that, uh, that isn't modeled in AppStream. 
So that is using this uh, uh, fast lane customization mechanism uh, to get that into the metadata as well. Um, and everything you see in there is uh, uh, coming through that uh, automatic process. Um, there's no manual entry there. Um, this conversion runs both in local builds and on binary factory. So if you look on binary factory, you will see next to the APK also a zip file uh, with the generated metadata. Um, so if you want to fine tune anything in there, you can inspect that both locally and on binary factory. Um, right, and then we need to get this into the app stores. Um, Let's first look at F-Droid. So F-Droid is actually less of a store and much more similar to what you might know from, an, uh, from a Linux distribution. Uh, the app is more, more of a package manager, and there, can, there are multiple repositories uh, with the packages you, you can install and update from. Um, there's an official repository provided by F-Droid itself, and there can be arbitrary many uh, third-party ones. Uh, like I mentioned before, we have a few third-party F-Droid repositories for all the uh, binary factory output. Um, those you would need to add as a user manually, though, so that is not ideal for discoverability. Uh, better would be to be present in the main repository of, of F-Droid. Um, that, however, requires that F-Droid builds the package themselves. Right? They, they don't accept random binaries uh, thrown at them. Uh, which makes sense from a uh, like security and uh, reviewability and reproducibility point of view. Um, their system, however, is uh, very much built around uh, like the, the usual Android technology stack, so the Java and Kotlin. Um, if we show up there with uh, 30 C++ libraries that need to be built for multiple architectures, um, that doesn't really work uh, that well. Um, Nico has managed to do it once for, for Ktrip, but it is a very lengthy and painful process. Um, so that still requires um, more work um, together with the DFDroid people on, on streamlining this and finding a way how we can um, manage that more, more sustainably. Um, as a stopgap measure, we might want to look into getting uh, at least our release repository added by default to the, the F-Droid client. Uh, then as a user, you still need to set the checkbox to enable that. Um, but at least you don't have to enter the, the long URL for that. Um, and then we have the other store, uh, Google Play. Um, that has also its, uh, its own pain points just in, in different places. Um, so to get started here, you need a Google account uh, and get that registered with the KDE EV store account. Uh, that is something Alesh can help you with. Um, and then you need to once go through the entire manual, uh, the, the entire setup process manually. Um, that involves filling in a bunch of forms. Um, most of them don't really apply to us. Um, they are about to properly register for all the evil stuff you can do, um, but we don't want to scam some, someone out of their money or um, trick them into online gambling or whatnot. Um, so this is usually just clicking no, 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 no on, on all the forms. Um, this process, however, requires uh, uh, review and approval steps from Google, uh, and that can take a day or two. So uh, that process takes time, even if it doesn't take a whole lot of work. Once that is done uh, and, and everything got approved, we have the ability to automatically interface with the, with the Play Store um, using the Fastlane Supply Tool. Um, this isn't deployed on binary factory yet. Uh, I have a working prototype for the, uh, for the metadata, um, but that still needs some work because currently it triggers um, a manual review of the image assets e each time we run it, and that takes one or two days. 
And if we run that process every 24 hours, uh, we end up with something that uh, just spams Google and will never finish. Uh, so that needs a bit more clever scripting to detect if we have changes in the, in the image assets. Um, but the screenshots I showed you earlier, that is already fully filled just by the, the automatic interface. Uh, and that's nice because that means we get uh, translations from the AppStream data into the Play Store uh, fully automatic on uh, via binary factory eventually. Uh, and the second part to look at is automatically uploading the resulting APKs, at least to the beta channel on, on Play Store. Uh, that's possible by the same mechanism, but that also still needs work uh, in terms of automating it. Um, the really unpleasant part is the, the next bit. Um, starting in August, the Play Store is said to require AAB packages, um, at least for new applications. Uh, and that, is, that has two problems. One is we have uh, so far, uh, um, so far we can't build those packages, um, and that potentially requires larger changes to how we do that, uh, because they include all the different architectures, not just one, um, and we build them separately. And the second part is it requires handing over your signing key to Google. Um, that's, of course, something we don't want to do for the existing one, as it would compromise the F-Trade repositories. Uh, on the other hand, you can't arbitrarily change signing keys, because that will break uh, uh, updating existing installations. Um, so that still needs uh, uh, some work in, in looking into. Um, yeah, there are a few more things um, to look into going forward. Um, it will, of course, be nice to have more apps and, and application maintainers participate in this and um, try the, the, the new system. Uh, to some extent, that has happened uh, with the Fela brothers uh, applying this to some of the Plasma mobile apps. Um, as I said, there is more we can look into for uh, further minimizing the, uh, the packages. Um, full static builds, for example, um, or uh, minifying the QML code. Um, there is the, the whole discussion that we had in the, in the past few days as well on the QA process and the Q, QA process automation. Um, from, that also applies to all other platforms. Um, that's something uh, that matters for Android as well, of course. Um, for license compliance, there is some interesting work going on from the KDE and Live people. Um, they, uh, they're working on uh, extending K about data and our standard about dialogues uh, to also cover uh, third party dependencies. Uh, that would go a long way in, in addressing that part. Um, there's the crash reporting feature in the Play Store to look into. Um, usable crash reports would, of course, uh, uh, good to have. Uh, but that will require that we generate the, uh, the corresponding symbol files and, and deliver them as well. Um, and then finally, if once we have uh, polished release packages uh, uh, available, um, there is the question, should they cost money in, in the Play Store? It's a similar discussion than what we had in the, in the past days as well for uh, the Microsoft Store on, on Windows. Um, only in the in the Play Store, of course, not in the in the free Android Store, uh, and in order to to support the KDE EV. Um, if you're interested in a topic, we will have or will have had a buff last Tuesday, um, and there is uh, the KDE Android uh, Matrix channel and mailing list that you might want to join. Okay. Uh, that's it. Do we have any questions? Yep, uh, we do have questions. Hello, Volker. Thanks for your contribution. Um, I guess that this, this this topic is going to be very, very uh, important for the near future. So from the questions, for the first one is from Fabian. He's asking, have you tried to compile a custom Qt build with disabled feature, for example, uh, 
dash no feature quick controls to imagine instead of later removing files at the Gradle level? Um, yeah, we, we are doing this um, to currently still very defensively. Um, I mean, we, we are stripping out some of the uh, uh, cute location backends, for example, that way. Um, we are probably also going to enable that for the quick control styles. Um, the problem is that whatever we, or that, that configuration is shared between all applications. So if we remove something that somebody relies on, uh, that is a problem, right? Um, we initially started with not even having queued widgets, uh, but that caused trouble for uh, for some apps that rely on queue action, which in Qt5 is still in, in Qt widget, and only in Qt6 actually moves to Qt GUI. So we had to bring uh, Qt widget back. So it's a bit about finding the right balance on what can we do um, generically and which uh, which parts need to be per application. Um, we also had the craft off yesterday where Hannah had some good ideas on how we can move even more of that stuff to a generic level. Uh, and reduce more and more of the stuff that applications need to do individually. So that's certainly a goal, but uh, it requires a bit of a, a balance. I see. OK, the second question for it, for now, there is just another question. Um, just if, if you attended the, the academy in the last, in the first part on Saturday and Sunday, you already know that you need to check the QE widget in the chat room. In, your, in the chat room of the talk to be able to uh, add questions. Or you can also, from time to time, the other people, the other chat moderator will link the um, place, the right, the URL, so where you can add the questions if you have troubles with the uh, widget. The second question is a bit uh, not exactly technical, is where does the banner image, not the application icon, on the Play Store come from? Uh... You mean this one? Uh, I mean, this one is, uh, well, I color painted that together from the icon and the KDE icon and put that into the Fastlane Overwrite folder. Um, so that's injected in, uh, uh, in, the, in the metadata, uh, as that's something that we don't have in, in AppStream. Um, that is, to my, I mean, Google, Play wants that as well, but I haven't found where it's using that. Uh, so far, I've only seen it uh, in, in F-Droid. Uh, the image on Google Play is just a large version of the, of the application icon. Um, that, that actually also is, uh, it needs to be a very large PNG, something that we don't have in our usual icons. Um, so that might also be something that you actually need to specifically create for, for Android. But it's, if you have an SVG icon, that is uh, very easy to do. OK. In the meantime, we have another question um, asking about making apps paid in the Play Store. Are you aware that once an app is made available free on the Play Store, you can change it to being paid, or only by making a new entry? Um, yeah, uh, as I said, I mean, this is an ongoing discussion on how we want to handle that at all. There were various possible ideas with having a free version and a for pay version or having a, the, the pay as an uh, additional upgrade or, um, yeah, I also think we will, we will end up experimenting with different models for the different apps and, and see what works, right? Um, uh, I mean, the monetization of this is a nice to have feature for, for getting more money into KDEV, but it's not something that is absolutely crucial that we need to get right from the, from the beginning. But yeah, I'm aware that there's uh, uh, certain restrictions on the App Store, and they keep changing, uh, and we'll need to work with this. Stuff. OK, thanks. So I don't see other questions coming. So. Um, if you're interested, um, where can people find you? I guess, well, the, apart from going back in time, as someone was suggesting on the uh, chat, and go to the both. Right. Um, yeah, I think the, the best place uh, for that is uh, the KD Android Matrix channel and the KD Android mailing list. Um, there, the people involved hang out, right? uh, myself included.
Okay. So thanks again for this effort. And uh, uh, we will, we're going to have a short break and we'll, we'll start in six minutes with the next speaker.